So up to this point, we've been uh, talking about authenticity and what it means to us individually. And um, in this next segment, we're going to think about what um, authenticity and issues of authenticity mean for us as a society. And uh, Kevin Jennings is uh, going to start us off. He's the, uh, currently the executive director of um, the Arcus Foundation and has a, uh, a really illustrious history of being an advocate for young people and uh, um, their right to be authentic in the world. Please welcome Kevin. Um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. And secondly, much more importantly, thank you for engaging in this very important work of enabling young people to be themselves. Uh, when young people can be themselves, they can fulfill their potential. When they can't be themselves, they can't. It's as simple as that. We all know that. Um, and we're all dedicated to making sure that we create a world and schools that enable young people to do that. Um, I decided that I would go back in time, actually specifically, go back 53 years to uh, when I was born and grew up as a little boy in Louisville, North Carolina, which is an unincorporated, then unincorporated town about 20 miles west of Winston-Salem. Uh, it was a very, very different time in 1963 when I was born, uh, particularly for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. It was still illegal in 49 states for people to have sexual relations if they were of the same sex. Being gay was still considered a mental illness, which could get you interred in a mental hospital where you could be lobotomized or castrated against your will. Um, it was a career ender to be known as a gay person thanks in part to President Eisenhower's Executive Order 104500, which in 1953 banned the employment of gay people by the federal government or any contractors with the federal government. So 1963 was a very different time for LGBT people. It was a different time for um, African American people. Uh, the state in which I grew up, North Carolina, would not legalize marriages between African American and white people until I was four years old in 1967. It was a very different time for women. Uh, my mother, who was a victim of, of domestic abuse at home, I asked her as an adult why she had not left my father. She said, where was I supposed to go to? Naively, I didn't realize that there were no battered women's shelters until the 70s. So in 1963, my mother might have wished to have left her husband, but there was nowhere for her to go. Now, in a world in which it was not very easy for many people to be themselves, I grew up in a particular cul-de-sac which made it even harder. My father was a Southern Baptist evangelist. Yes, that church. The one that broke away from the main Baptist church because they liked slavery. Uh, a fact for which they would not apologize for until 1996, 150 years or so after it mattered. Um, now, my father had very, very narrow ideas about proper behavior for men, women, uh, for white people with regards to people of color, for gay people, and growing up as a young person, this made my life very, very difficult and constrained. I learned my first really vivid lesson around this in 1970 when my older brother came home. We lived in a trailer, oh, I'm going backwards, uh, this trailer to be specific, um, and I it's, it's a small trailer, as you can see, and my parents and my brother were in a huge argument. And I was confused, so I got up and I came out into the main living area to see what they were fighting about. My brother, who was 15 years older than me, he was 22, 1970, had just delivered the news to my parents that he had married an African-American woman. This did not go over well with my family, as you might imagine. Uh, in fact, it went over so poorly that my brother had to leave North Carolina for his physical safety and that of his wife, and they moved to Connecticut, and I would not see them for five years. It was a very, very different time and place. Um, my mother, and this is her family, had grown up in Appalachia. She was born in 1925. Uh, women had only had the right to vote for four years when my mother was born, mm -hmm. and there weren't many options for poor white girls in Appalachia in 1925. So my mother dropped out of school when she was in sixth grade, married my father at age 19, 
My father, being an itinerant minister, didn't believe my mother should work outside the home, so she didn't, until my father died of a massive heart attack when I was eight, and my mother was thrust back into the workforce at age 46 with a sixth grade education. My mother did the kinds of jobs you get when you have a sixth grade education. She cleaned people's houses. She was a lunch lady in our cafeteria. She worked at McDonald's and dreamed that life would be better for her youngest son, me, than it had been for her. My mother was one of the smartest people I'd ever met. She did the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle in ink every Sunday because she didn't make mistakes. <laughs> But being born a woman and poor in 1925, she would never have the opportunity to live out her genius. And she was determined I would get an education. I would get the education that had been denied to her. Now from an early age, I also began to realize that I was different. Um, I didn't yet understand what the word gay meant, but I knew I was different than other boys, that the Playboy magazines that my older brother hid under his mattress where mom would never find them, um, <laughs> somehow just didn't interest me very much. And as I grew older, I learned there was a word for people like me, um, that word being faggot. And I recoiled in horror from that word. Now, I'd like to tell you at this point that I'm describing to you ancient history things that happened long, long ago that no longer occur. But I just would be lying to you if I did. The fact is, I found an organization called GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. And we, found, we do a survey every two years called the GLSEN National School Climate Survey of what LGBT students are going through at school. And one of the things the most recent survey revealed is that harassment is the rule, not the exception if you're an LGBT child. Primarily verbal harassment, but also physical harassment, and one in six actually experienced physical assault while at school. Now some people say, well that's uh, statistics from GLSEN, and you can't trust them, and they're biased. So we had commissioned the Harris Polling Organization to ask kids in high school, who are the people who mainly, can you still hear me? Yes. Who are the people who mainly get bullied? No surprise to me, the, this was the results that came back. The number one reason kids get bullied is because of how they look. Too tall, too short, too fat, too thin, too whatever. The number two reason is because they have a disability. Either a learning disability or a physical disability. The number three reason is they are, or people think they are, gay, lesbian, or bisexual. The number four reason is how masculine or feminine they are, their gender expression. So LGBT causes are two of the top four reasons that kids get bullied in school in 2016, according to the Harris Polling Organization. This isn't ancient history, my teenage years, unfortunately. I tried very, very hard to not be gay. Uh, I mean, look how gorgeous I was. Who could resist? <laughs> uh, and here I am at my junior prom, trying very, very hard to um, live out the life script that had been provided to me that I had been told was the right way to live. And then, through an incredible stroke of good luck, I got into college and got a scholarship to go to Harvard, and I was able to achieve my mother's dream of becoming the first of 46 first cousins in my family to ever graduate from college. Now, at Harvard I learned that there was more than the fundamentalist path I had been raised to believe was the way to go. And I decided to be true to myself rather than trying to be something I wasn't. And it began me on a very different course over the path of my adult life. At my um, graduation, my mother, however, reminded me of the fundamentalist church in which we grew up. She said to me, and I always do my mother in her accent because it's the only way I can hear her voice. <laughs> so I'm not making fun of her, but that's how she sounds in my head. She said, pulled me aside, she whispered in my ear, Kevin, remember, to whom much has been given, much will be expected. And I was very aware that I had been given an opportunity unlike anything anyone in my family had ever had before, which was a chance to get a college education. So I decided to go back into the field of education and to work with young people to try and help them live out the dreams that I had been privileged enough to live out. Now, I mentioned that I tried very, very hard to live up to a certain script when I was a teenager. 
That was a very costly mistake on my part. It was a mistake that almost cost me my life. When I was 16, I decided that there was no way I could be the straight person I was trying to be, and I attempted suicide. I'd like to tell you that my story is unique. However, the CDC just came out with a study in August in which they compared lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth who they found represent 11% of all high school students in America. Now keep in mind, that number must be a floor, not a ceiling, because those are kids who are willing to tell the CDC that they're lesbian, gay, or bisexual, so the real number must actually be even higher. Um, and what they found was that lesbian, gay, and bisexual kids were vastly more likely to attempt suicide than heterosexual kids, about five times more likely to be specific. Now, having gone into teaching, and here I am, my first teaching job at Moses Brown School in Providence, Rhode Island. Whenever I show these uh, slides to kids, they're, I, I can always see they're reacting with one of two reactions, which is like, that's really you? Or like, <laughs> shit, you look worse. Uh, but um, <laughs> that's me at age 22, teaching high school, scared to death because I had the entire offensive line in my first period class, and these were the kids who'd been bullying me five years before, and now I was supposed to be in charge. Um, I ended up going to another school in Concord, Massachusetts, where I had a student come to me who was struggling. And in that conversation, he came out to me that he was gay. And of course, he had figured out that I was gay, although in 1988, there, were, there was only one state that protected people from being fired based on the fact that of their sexual orientation, that was Wisconsin. So I was not out at that point. But kids are smart. I was called the glass closet. They know who is and who isn't. So Brewster had come to me, and he too was thinking of killing himself. Mm. And I said to him, Brewster, you have so much to live for. Let's get you some help. And he said to me something I've never forgotten. He said, why shouldn't I? My life isn't worth saving anyway. And that took me back to not many years before when I had been 16 years old, when I had felt the exact same way, and I said to myself, whatever I do, I will make sure that I spend the rest of my life helping young people not feel the way I felt when I was growing up. First thing I did was a few weeks later, we had a school chapel, it wasn't a religious school, um, but they had a tradition called chapel where every senior and any teacher who wanted to could start the school day off by giving a 15-minute talk on a topic of their choosing. And on November 10th, 1988, I came out to the entire school. Um, different time, height of the AIDS crisis. This is almost 30 years ago. No laws, as I mentioned, protecting you unless you were lucky enough to be in Wisconsin. And I assumed I would probably lose my job. And I also had a nightmare the night before that kids had written faggot all over my car. So when I got to my classroom and I discovered kids writing on my blackboard, I immediately kind of blacked out because I thought they're writing faggot on my blackboard. I can't believe this. And I opened the door and they all scurried away. Um, and I said, just erase the board. Look like it doesn't bother you. And I went to the board. Before I erased it, I decided to read it. And what they'd actually done was written we love you, Kevin, and we're so proud of you. And every kid in the classroom had signed the board. Two kids in that classroom, Liz Wong and Tom Darling, met that year. And 11 years later, they asked me if I would officiate at their wedding. When I asked them why me, uh, Tom said, well, I'm not really into organized religion. And we started talking about who symbolized us, the importance of love. And we realized you were the one who taught us that. So we'd like you to officiate at our wedding. A year later, and I, I know I only have two minutes left, so I'm going to beg permission to go over by a couple. Um, but it's worth it, I promise. A year later, a young girl named Biz got up and did her chapel. And I want to read you a long excerpt from it. She wasn't a girl I knew terribly well. She had been in my sophomore history class. I remember to this day, she was the best essay writer I ever had. But she wasn't a kid I was particularly close to. But this is what she had to say. By the time I entered fourth grade, I hated being a girl. Why shouldn't I? I had to fight harder for attention than the 20 boys in my crowded classroom of 37. My fifth grade teacher told me I'd never have a boyfriend if I didn't learn how to keep my mouth shut. 
Every storybook I read, every TV show I watched, every billboard on the highway seemed to tell me that I mattered less, that any value I had was purely aesthetic. Perhaps most of all, I hated my body for making me vulnerable. When I was a little girl, a man taught me I had no control over what happened to my body, and I believed him. I never blamed him for my abuse, I blamed my sex. After all, he couldn't have done these things to me if I wasn't a girl. I started having regular nightmares about rape and being raped when I was 12 years old. If I wasn't born a girl, I thought I would be immune. If I did not possess this anatomical vulnerability, I would be free. I remember staring at the reflection of my naked 12-year-old child's body and feeling like I wanted to die, overwhelmed with shame and disgust at fat, fat, fat me. I began to grow terrified that I would gain weight and lose my value in the eyes of my parents, my teachers, and the boys I mindlessly wanted to please. So finally, one sunny morning in April, I bought my first package of diet pills in the Concord CVS. Some women I know can and do lose 10 pounds in one week. I found it impossible to stop eating altogether, so I took triple doses of diet pills and went to class shaking too hard to take notes. Fasting got harder and harder, and when I gave in at eight, I hated myself for being weak, for being out of control. It didn't take me long to find the solution. One, two, as many as seven times a day, I would carefully tie my hair back and purge. When my stomach was empty, I washed my face, brushed my teeth, and continued on with my day. For close to two years, nobody knew what was going on. I was good at hiding the truth. My parents, my sisters, and my friends were all oblivious to what was going on, often in the next room. Then last year, Kevin Jennings gave a chapel that changed my life. He talked about courage and about strength. He said that while it takes a certain amount of strength to force oneself to do what society demands, to conform to someone else's ideal, it takes far more to be what you want, to be true to who you are on the inside. That has stuck with me throughout my struggle to change my definition of strength and courage. I used to pride myself on my control and willpower. I used to congratulate myself on every pound shed. To me, that was strength. What I've since realized is that what I was doing was giving power back who deserved it least. Every time I stepped with trepidation onto the scale, I supported the English teacher who told me I was too pretty to be smart. Every time I had a diet pill for breakfast, I agreed with my dad that yes, indeed, I could stand to lose a couple of pounds. Every time I purged, I let the man who abused me tell me yet again that my body was not mine, but his. And with this chapel, I am rejecting all of that. I am telling everyone that most of the time, I love who I am and I love what I am. The ghost of my abuser will no longer haunt me because I know now I have the power to say no and I know I have the right. I am no longer willing to live my life for other people or by other people's standards. I will say what I want and do what I want and eat what I want. Not because I'm a woman, but because I am me. I am taking back my body and making it my own. I wasted four years hating myself because of the body I was born with, and I don't deserve to be hated. None of us do. Just so you know, Biz is a uh, PhD from Harvard and a practicing psychologist today. <laughs> she made it. But the amazing thing for me was, she was obviously a brilliant girl because she realized that my secret plan in coming out as this kind of southern white trash gay man <laughs> was because I wanted to be an inspiration to northern Jewish bulimic girls. <laughs> that was the plan. That was the gay agenda. Um, but the reality is, and these are kids from the Concord Academy Gay Straight Alliance at the March on Washington in 1993 for equal rights for LGBT people, the reality is, is that uh, Biz figured out it was about something much more profound about whether, whether or not you're gay or straight. It's about whether or not you have the freedom and the right to live your life by your own standards, to be who you are. And even though we were in different closets, we were suffering many of the same things. And she was able to see past labels like gay to realize that's the same struggle I'm fighting. So I think when we are authentic with kids, we enable kids to be authentic with us. 
And that is the first step to building truly meaningful adult-child relationships that foster well-being and learning. And it reminds me, and my final comment, is from Mel King, who was the first black state senator in Massachusetts where I taught. I brought Mel to speak at our school 30 years ago. And he told a story which I've never forgotten. He said, you know, I sponsored the bill that put curb cuts on the sidewalks in the state of Massachusetts. And I did that because disabled people came to me and asked me to sponsor the bill. He said, I walk around my district in Boston now and I notice a lot of people use those curb cuts are not disabled. They are skateboarders trying to get up on the sidewalk, or bicyclists, or parents pushing their children in a pram, or people hauling their groceries in a cart, or elderly people who just need a little bit more ease getting up on the sidewalk. And I realized that when you make access easier for one group, you make access easier for everyone. And that in the end is what this work is about, creating access so that everyone can get what they need to be able to be themselves and grow into the incredible adults they're entitled to be. Thanks for letting me go over. Thanks for inviting me. Kevin came to talk to us in spite of being under the weather. So to accommodate, uh, we'll, we'll make a couple of minutes for questions and answers from you, and then he's going to go home and go to bed. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Alex ran out and brought me tea with honey. So, you know, this is a full service conference, i got to tell you. Um, any questions or comments or reactions or thoughts? Yes. As I, as I was listening to you talk, I just remembered that when I first started teaching, um, the rule was don't smile until November. That's right. And, and that is the rule that teachers get. And your, your talk, just when you talked about being human with people, not with just with kids, but with people, it just made me realize that that's really what we do this for. Mm. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Or just an aside, I mean, as you're speaking and thinking of the South African concept of Ubuntu, so I am, therefore, you know, I am because of you who are, you know, part of me, and I'm obviously loosely translating it, mm -hmm. but you have to think more like that. Mm -hmm. This side of the room, the shy side of the room, I guess? <laughs> yes? You know, the thing that I've always been mystified by is this. Kids have the strongest BS detectors of anyone in the world. They can smell it more than anyone, and they have less tolerance for it. So why all pedagogy is not founded on first being authentic confuses me, because the teachers that kids trust are the ones they know are not BSing them. And boy, do they know it. You know, you can ask kids. Um, you know, what is it that Maya Angelou once said, you know, um, you may forget how I treat you, but you always remember how I make you feel. Uh, that's a bad paraphrase, but that's the basic concept. You know, the reality is, is that when kids feel that you care and are real, um, since I've gone over, I'm going to tell one more horrifying story. Um, <laughs> It dates back to my days at Teachers College 22 years ago when I got my master's degree here. So um, in my first few years of teaching, I taught at this private school in Concord, Massachusetts, which was pretty white. And I was very concerned one day in my US history class because I had 16 white students and one black student, and we were discussing slavery. And I was worried that someone was going to say the wrong thing or something. And um, I went into the classroom, kind of wound up. And I was one of those funky liberal teachers that didn't make kids raise their hand. So what, what is your name? Lily. Lily? My name? Yeah. Arithu. 
a Rithu. So if a Rithu and Alex were talking at the same time, and Alex was someone who talked a lot, and a Rithu didn't say much, I would just say a Rithu, a Rithu, a Rithu, a Rithu, to let people know that she had the floor. Because I didn't like kids raising their hands, because it just created a power dynamic I didn't like in the classroom. So I ask a question, and my one black student's kid named Matt. Matt is not a very talkative person to begin with. He rarely contributes to class. It's just not him. Um, but at this point, Matt starts to answer the question. At the same time as Belinda, who answers every question I ask, uh, starts to ask a question. So I'm so excited that Matt is going to participate in class, which he rarely does, and on this very sensitive topic where he's the only black student that I turn and I look at him. I'm so excited. I look at him and I say, black? <laughs> um, no one laughed in that classroom. You could have heard a pin drop. And um, I realized what I'd done, and I did what every mature professional would do at this point. I said, I have to go now. <laughs> I left the classroom, and I stood in the hallway and hyperventilated for about two minutes and realized I can't leave them in there till June. <laughs> it, it was a tempting thought. I thought I could order pizza. Um, I have to go back in there. So I went back in there, and I said, um, we need to talk about what I just did. And we had a conversation, and I'll never forget one exchange during it. Um, Belinda said, I don't know the same girl. She said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Am I supposed to like not notice that people are black and not say anything about it? And Matt looked at her and said, you think I don't know I'm black? <laughs> Years go by, Matt graduates from high school, goes off to college. I eventually come to Columbia um, to get my master's degree. And I don't know if anybody actually here go to TC or is a TC alum. Do you still have to use the gym across the street? Yeah, okay, so 22 years, some things never change. If you want to use the gym at TC, you have to go across the street to the undergrad gym at Columbia. All right, so I was over there one day, and I was working out, and I hear this voice behind me, Mr. Jennings. And I turn around, and it's Matt. I had forgotten that Matt went to Columbia. So I said, Matt, it's so good to see you. What are you up to? And he said, I'm doing great. I'm a senior. I'm going to be graduating with honors. I saw you over here and I just wanted to come over and tell you, you know, I majored in history because of your class. And I wanted to say thanks. Now, this is the moral of my story. You will never screw up as badly as I did. <laughs> it is impossible to screw up any worse than that. But Matt knew that I genuinely cared. And you know what kids will do if they know you genuinely care? They'll let you get away with murder. <laughs> because if they know you're really trying and you really care, and you're really authentic with them, they'll forgive all manner of nonsense, all stupid mistakes. And that's what Matt was able to do. And I always tell that story um, when I speak with people working in the field of education, because we all have our nightmares you know, of th saying the stupid thing in class. Well, I've said the stupidest thing you can say, uh, and I survived, and the student ended up majoring in my subject because of that class. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Thank you. I'm going back to bed. You have to go to your conference. <laughs>